All right, so the expenditure cycle, a lot of what we're going to cover with the acquisition and expenditure cycle is just a recap um, of what we've already covered with the sales and collection cycle. The difference is we're looking at a different set of accounts. But the audit approach is exactly the same. It's just that we're looking at different accounts. And so the assertions take on different, uh, the assertions mean the same thing, but where the risk is is going to be different because of the uh, accounts that we're looking at. And so, again, the overview of the acquisition and expenditure cycle is you pr uh, process purchase orders, you receive those goods and services, once you receive those goods and services, you recognize the liability, and then you process and record the cash disbursements after receiving it. So whereas with the sales and collection cycle, what triggered uh, recognition of revenue was actually shipping the, doc, uh, shipping the goods, right, or performing the service. Here, with the expenditure cycle, uh, the acquisition expenditure cycle, what triggers the recognition of a liability is when we actually receive the goods or the services. Right? So the receiving report becomes very important with respect to recognizing the liability. So the receiving report takes on the same importance for recognition that this, the um, shipping document took on in the sales and collection cycle. Um, some of the inherent risk associated with the acquisition and expenditure cycle, what your concern here is an understatement of liabilities. So if your concern is an understatement of liabilities, which assertion do you think takes on uh, greater importance? Or if you're concerned about understatement, John? Exactly. Right? Because remember what we said, uh, occurrence is concerned with overstatement and uh, completeness is concerned with understatement. Right? So what you're, and when you think about it, um, if you compare the acquisition cycle to the revenue cycle, how likely is it if a company is trying to manage earnings, how likely is it that they're going to understate sales, right? They're rarely going to understate sales. If there's going to be uh, problems, then they're looking to overstate sales. So they're, they're, that's why the occurrence assertion um, is really important in the sales and collection cycle or that's where, you, where your risk is and then, then on the flip side with the acquisition and expenditure cycle if they're going to manage earnings or try to grow their you know make their income seem better than it really is then they would try to understate expenses not overstate expenses right okay so we're, we're concerned about unrecorded liabilities so errors can occur from ineffective internal controls, right? So if you don't have good internal controls, let's say you don't have good internal controls over the receiving process, and that the company doesn't always record the recognition of um, a liability when they receive the goods, right? That would lead to an understatement of the liabilities because you would have received the goods or services, but you wouldn't, the company would not have recognized the liability associated with that. Um, Fraudulent financial reporting could result from reporting liabilities or expenses in the incorrect period, right? And so again, if you're trying, most com if companies are committing fraudulent financial reporting and they're trying to do that by managing the expenditures or managing liabilities, they're going to look, right? So cutoff tests become really important, right? And we'll talk about a search for unrecorded liabilities. Um, also looking at non-cancelable purchase agreements, right? So we talk about purchase orders, and purchase orders are really a contract, right? Because it's what the company issues to a vendor for services or goods. And so it's really important. Remember in the, in the case that we went over, one of the things that, uh, one of the issues is that the auditors only confirmed the terms of the contract. Right? But they didn't evaluate the terms. And in that case, it was a contingent sale, which under you know, financial accounting standards, you can't recognize that revenue if you have a contingent sale. The important thing with purchase orders is to also evaluate the terms of the purchase order, right? Because you want to know if the company has a, some type of agreement where they can't cancel, then they've basically guaranteed that they're going to pay for that. 
right? That they, they've accepted that, uh, those goods, that they're gonna accept those goods or services. Um, the other thing you wanna do is sometimes when you have these agreements, the auditor has to evaluate it in terms of market. So this is, again, where there's more judgment involved. Is there a significant decline in the market um, so that the value of those goods are no longer uh, what they were when the company entered into the agreement? The other thing is you want to see if companies are capitalizing expenses. Why would a company want to capitalize an expense? What do you think? Think WorldCom. John? Right. You put, you're hanging up on the balance sheet. Because if you're hanging up on the balance sheet, by capitalizing it, that's what you're doing. You're hanging it up on the balance sheet. And by hanging it up on the balance sheet, it's not flowing through your income statement. If it's not flowing through your income statement, then your net income is going to be unaffected by it, right? You're going to increase net income, essentially, because you're not recognizing that expense. And that's essentially what WorldCom was doing in a nutshell, right? They were capitalizing expenses that should have flown, um, flowed through the income statement. So that's another area that is important <clears throat> to look at. So let's take a look at exhibit A2 um, at the assertion. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, page 320, yes. Let me get my glass. So what uh, Exhibit A2 does is relate the assertion and the risk uh, as it pertains to the uh, procurement process or acquisition and payables process. Okay. So what you'll see is that, for example, with the balance assertions related to uh, balance, uh, balance sheet accounts such as accounts payable or liabilities, you'll see where completeness, there's a high risk there, right? Because the, what an auditor is going to be concerned with is an understatement of liabilities or unrecorded liabilities. Um, valuation and allocation is also going to be a high risk as well. Um, you, again, if the company has non-cancelable purchase orders, the auditor is going to look at whether or not there's a significant decline in the market value. So when, an, again, so when we're thinking about the assertions, because remember, we're thinking about where's our risk, right? Where is the risk um, that, uh, that there could be a material misstatement in the accounts and it not be detected? And so, again, and as the auditor is going through the audit planning process and they're assessing inherent risk, they're assessing control risk, they're, they're, these are the types of things that they're doing. They're thinking about what assertions, where's my risk, um, or what's the greatest wi risk with respect to liabilities, unrecorded liabilities. Then they look at the process that the company has in place, such as the control process, to determine if the control process is effective so that it would detect or prevent um, an error from occurring and not being detected on a timely basis. Okay? So, again, the assertions aren't going to change, right? The assertions are the assertions. Management's assertions don't change. What is going to be different is our audit approach related to those assertions because we're looking at different accounts. Our risk is going to be different. You saw the difference between occurrence and um, a completeness when you're looking at the sales and collection cycle versus the um, expenditure cycle. So the types of documents that the auditor wants is going to look at in this cycle would be things like the purchase requisition. And as I said, before when we talked about this, a purchase requisition usually comes from the user department. So if I'm in the accounting department and I need supplies, I'm going to issue a purchase requisition to the purchasing department, and then the purchasing department will prepare a purchase order. They'll perform uh, competitive bids, or they'll make sure that we, the purchase is placed with an approved authorized vendor, and the purchase order is what goes to the vendor. Do we create a liability at this point? What do you think? No, right? Because the only thing that we've done is that we've requested goods from a vendor, right? We've ordered those goods. 
when those goods come in or when the service is performed, a receiving report is issued. Right? So the, the, ship, uh, the uh, warehouse will issue a receiving report. Um, and that receiving report will, what will be the basis to update the accounting records, right? So at the point that this receiving report, um, the goods come in, um, we're going to debit inventory and credit accounts payable based on this receiving report. So the receiving report is used to update the accounting records. The vendor invoice, right, is uh, what the vendor sends and that is, uh, you know, what is used to uh, submit the payment, obviously checks, cash disbursement journal, um, the cash accounts payable master file, which is a list of all outstanding payables, the cash disbursements master file, which represents all of the cash disbursements. What else is, uh, what uh, other file is not up here is the vendor master file. And the vendor master file is important. Companies should control that because you want to make sure that you're purchasing from approved vendors and uh, that the company is already approved. And this is really important when a company, let's say, is in manufacturing, right? So they're manufacturing goods. It's important for them to know that they're purchasing from vendors who have high quality, so they're purchasing high quality goods. Vendors who will deliver the goods on time, because if those goods aren't delivered on time, it impacts their production process. So it's really important. Uh, the vendor master file is a, um, also a very important document, uh, record. Um, Types of things that uh, data files that the auditor is going to use to get evidence would be the open purchase orders. And what auditor wants to do with open purchase orders, again, look to see if there's any non-cancelable agreements, look to see if, you know, how long the purchase order has been open, if it's been open for a long time, is it a possibility that the goods were received and it was just never updated or that, that the amount was paid, unmatched receiving reports. And unmatched, because the receiving report should be matched to the purchase order. So an, an, a control that the auditor would look for is that the, when uh, goods come in, that the, the, the warehouse just, doesn't just accept those goods. They look to match those goods to an approved purchase order. Right? They want to make sure that they're not receiving goods that were not ordered. So the purchase order should be in the system. They should match those goods. Um, to the uh, purchase order in terms of the vendor, the quantity, and so forth. So that's what we mean. So if it's an unmatched receiving report, um, so they've received goods that were not matched to a purchase order, which would be a breakdown in internal controls, or that the company, or that they're not, the goods were received and they were ordered, but they didn't do the match. They didn't perform the matching, which is also a breakdown that the control is not working. Any unmatched vendor invoices, because again, this can uh, uh, indicate un, uh, outstanding payables or unrecorded payables. Um, accounts, vouchers, payable trial balance. And we'll call it, you'll see accounts payable or vouchers payable used interchangeably. And a voucher, because um, one of the things we talked about, I think, last week was in terms of the disbursement cycle, what you're looking for is a voucher package. You'll see companies will have what they call a voucher package, and that voucher package will include uh, the purchase requisition, the purchase order, the receiving report, the vendor's invoice, and a copy or documentation that the, a disbursement was made. Right? So that's a th uh, matching. The purchase journal right, is just listing all outstanding, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, all purchases made, and then uh, obviously fixed assets is in the acquisition and expenditure cycle, so you'll see fixed asset reports that should support the amounts recorded in the general ledger. So the major functions uh, in the purchasing cycle or acquisition and expenditure cycle is obviously requisitions, which I talked about already. Uh, the uh, user departments issue requisitions. You want to see controls over requisitions because not everyone in the user department should have the ability to requisition goods. Because when you're requisitioning goods and you're sending this to the purchasing department, you're essentially committing the company's funds. Uh, purchasing department is separate, a separate department that is responsible for handling all of the purchases for the company so that the purchasing department would be responsible for performing competitive bids, ensuring that 
purchases are made in accordance with the company's standards, uh, ensuring that uh, they're purchasing from authorized vendors. What some controls that you expect to see with purchasing is that that function, uh, people in that group are rotated so that I'm not always assigned to the same vendor. Right? That, we, that the, the responsibilities are rotated. And why do you think that is? Why does it matter that you rotate that, uh, vendors and purchasing managers? Why does it matter? Jimmy? Um, that, yep, yeah, you could have a second pair of eyes, in hindsight, what else? What, what, what is management trying to prevent from happening? By switching up vendors, switching up uh, employee purchasing agents and vendors. Uh, fraud, right. Um, so fictitious purchases, fraud. Because what they're trying to do is make sure or, or mitigate the chances that a, a, an un, a relationship will develop where this, uh, the purchasing agent is getting kickbacks from the vendor, you know, because if you're required to do competitive bids, you want to make sure that that purchasing agent is actually performing competitive bids, right, or obtaining competitive bids, I should say. And then what happens if you know, I'm with this vendor and I'm, I said, the vendor says to me, look, just tell me what the bids are, I'll always come in lowest, right? I'll always come in at the lowest or you, and if I can't come in at the lowest, you still give me the business, right? So they want to try to avoid those types of relationships occurring. Companies, <coughs> excuse me, companies will always have policies, purchasing policies, so that purchase agents aren't allowed to take gifts from vendors. Um, some of them will say it has to be, you know, below some monetary value, you know, because people send over the holidays basket, food baskets and things like that. So it has to be some be below some monetary value because they want to make sure that their purchasing agent isn't throwing the company's business at vendors and then getting some, uh, some feedback, uh, monetary value back for that. So you'll see things like rotating purchasing agents. The receiving, obviously, receives the goods. Um, and make sure that the good, the purchase was off, the goods that they're receiving that they were authorized, um, and also making sure that they're accurate. So if we ordered 50 gallons of paint, that we receive 50 gallons of paint and not 500 gallons of paint. Uh, when goods are, are received, the accounts payable department should be notified, or the accounting department should be notified. And that so that invoices can be processed, and this is important, right? Because we're going to get a vendor invoice. We want to make sure that the receiving report, that that vendor that's billing us, that we actually receive the goods. So there should be a matching of the receiving report and the vendor invoice. Uh, disbursements, when we disperse, the company disperses, you want to make sure those th the, the three things I talked about are present. Purchase order which is the commitment, that is an authorized commitment to purchase, the receiving report to indicate that we actually received the goods, and the vendor invoice to show that we've been billed for it. Uh, then accounts payable and general ledger in terms of recording those transactions. Um, as I said, uh, in terms of the approach, the approach is no different than we discussed. You need to understand, the, the auditor is going to understand the internal control environment. So they're going to talk to management. They're going to look at flow charts. They're going to look at documentation to get an idea, uh, an understanding of the internal controls, how internal controls work. Because based on that understanding, they have to assess their planned control risk. So right, they have to assess whether or not they're going to rely on internal controls. And that's going to affect the nature, timing, and extent of the testing that they do. Um, they're going to test those, ident if they rely on internal controls and they deem internal controls effective, then they're going to do test the controls, right? So those test the control, by relying on internal controls, it reduces the amount of substantive testing that you're going to do. Um, same thing, segregation of duties is a key control activity. Remember, we want to make sure that people are not in a position where they can perpetrate and a fraud and then cover it up, right? So some key uh, segregation of duties for the purchasing cycle would be 
that the purchasing function should be segregated from the requisitioning function. So, because again, the requisitioning function is an authorization to purchase goods. And then the purchasing function actually goes out and commits to that. So if I'm able to requisition goods and then and also uh, you know, uh, order those goods, uh, place an order, I could, be, I could order goods for my own purposes. The invoice processing function should be segregated from the accounts payable function. Uh, the disbursement function should be segregated from the accounts payable function. And the accounts payable function should be segregated from the general ledger function. Right? So basically, you want to make sure that I don't have custody of assets and also have the ability to update the accounting records or authorize transactions. So you want to make sure, again, same, same concept. It's just that we're applying this to the purchasing cycle. Uh, control procedures would be information processing controls, such as comparing the purchase order number to the bill of lading. Uh, with the company PO. So the bill of lading is the receiving report. Compare quantities against the receiving report and purchase order, right? Because you want to make sure that you're actually receiving goods that you ordered, that you're not, because once you accept the, the vendor's goods, then by accepting them, you're agreeing to pay for them. Uh, compare prices against the quoted price. Uh, recompute vendors' invoices, determine when to pay the invoices. Companies will have policies on whether or not they take advantage of cash discounts by paying early. Um, and make sure that vouchers are properly prepared. That's the three-way match. Uh, physical controls, again, prepare a receiving report when goods are received immediately. Goods, so auditors will look to see that when they're observing the process, they're going to look to make sure that when goods come in, that they see that a receiving report is generated. Uh, count the in, verify inventory quantities. Uh, restrict access to inventories uh, by keeping them in a secured location. And that's, again, just making sure you're safeguarding your assets. Uh, you want to make sure that performance reviews are going on so that you expect to see evidence that they're comparing purchase data to data from previous years, um, uh, reviewing bids to ensure that the documentation exists that to support those bids. Remember, I said the companies require competitive biddings. You want to see that there's reconciliations um, between accounts, between the uh, um, general ledger and the accounts payable subledger. Um, this is in your textbook, but again, the assertions about classes of transactions and events. So the same thing, we're going to look at occurrence, that purchases and related events have been recorded and have occurred, that completeness, all purchases that should be recorded, have been recorded, and so forth. So again, it's the same thing, accuracy, that the amounts, the data are accurate, so that the amounts that um, that they charge, that they're being charged, agrees to approve price lists that they have with vendors, uh, or agrees to that the receiving information on the receiving report or the vendor invoice agrees to the purchase order because the purchase order is a contract between the company and the vendor, a cutoff that is recorded in the correct period, and classification that um, they have been classified in, in uh, correctly. Again, assertions about account balances at year end and substantive procedures, right? Existence, rights and obligations, completeness, valuation and allocation. So for example, with existence. With existence, when we talked about a balance sheet accounts receivable, we talked about confirmation. So that's a standard uh, and a required approach to um, auditing accounts receivable is to confirm. You don't have to confirm accounts payable. Unlike accounts receivable, there's no mandate uh, to confirm accounts payable. All right, most, uh, that is the auditor's uh, judgment, whether or not they want to confirm. So sometimes what you'll see is they might confirm uh, vendors that they consider high risk. Uh, but again, a substantive procedure would be to just vouch the recorded payables to vendor invoices, um, receiving reports and purchase orders, right? That's how you know, right? Because if we order goods, we're going to debit inventory and credit accounts for payable. So if we have a receiving report, we know we should rec a receiving report that matches the purchase order and ties to the vendor invoice. That, that way we know that a, a liability existed, exists because we, we recorded that, right? We, we have the receipt. 
of that item. Why is it different for accounts receivable? Why can't we have this, use the same approach with accounts receivable? Why do we have to confirm accounts receivable? <clears throat> What's different about accounts receivable versus accounts payable? Yes, Omar. Exactly. 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 Right? We know if we receive the goods that we have a liability. We are obligated to pay it. Now, on the flip side, the, customer, the vendor, that's a different transaction for them, right? But we know that the existence of that liability is fair, right? It, we should record it. Accounts receivable, what we, the, the wild card, as Omar points out, is that we don't know if the customer is going to pay it, right? They should pay it. We don't know the customer's financial condition. We don't know if the customer has an issue, right? So it, it, there's, it, there's some doubt about it, right? So we can, we can, whereas we can verify the accounts payable because all of the records uh, and documents that we need are uh, in-house, right? We could look at the receiving report. Uh, but accounts receivable, to know that we don't know if the customer is challenging that accounts receivable. Okay. Rights and obligation, again, the company, the obligations, the, the, the payables record, the liabilities recorded on the books belong to the company. Look at bank confirmation. So when we talked about bank confirms, I mentioned last week, that uh, one of the things that companies will, in the confirm, the confirmations, they'll ask, on the confirmation, there'll be um, something asking about any liabilities or outstanding, you know, lines of credit, things like that, of that nature. Um, look at board of directors minutes, things like that. Uh, perform search for unrecorded liabilities, that's completeness, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then valuation and allocation is basically testing the mathematical accuracy. Unlike accounts receivable where we have um, <clears throat> estimates, uh, you know, accounts payable is not an estimate. You're not going to uh, estimate what your accounts payable. There's no guesswork with accounts payable. Are there liability accounts where there, there's guesswork? What do you think? Can you think of any liability accounts where there is a, an estimate that has to be made? Warranties. Warranties, exactly. Warranties is one. What's another one? Someone had a different, Jimmy? Well, that's on the uh, uh, asset side, right? That's what the accounts receivable. I'm thinking about liabilities. Uh, contingent liabilities, yep. Omar? Taxes, right? So, and a lot of your taxes is based is going to be done by tax people because you, you know, you could estimate what your tax liability is, uh, right? And deferred revenue, right? Deferred revenue it doesn't flow through the revenue, through the income statement, right? It flows through the balance sheet. It's a liability. Right? Okay, um, completeness. So. The completeness assertion, as I said, takes on, is, is an important, really important assertion. Uh, and it's, it, it has a higher risk value with uh, uh, liabilities. Um, and so a, a standard audit procedure is to perform a search for unrecorded liability. And some of the things that an auditor does is basically, obviously, you're going to talk to your client and say, you know, do you have any liabilities that haven't been recorded, that should be recorded at year end. How do you go about identifying that you, uh, you've recorded all of the liabilities that should be recorded? What's the process? Other things they'll do is scan the open purchase order file, right? Because you want to see if the purchases have been outstanding for a long time, is it a possibility that you did receive the goods and just neglected to record the transaction? examine all unmatched vendor statements or invoices, right? Because the vendor statements or vendor invoices should be matched to purchase order and a receiving report. Uh, examine all unmatched receiving reports occurring near year end. And so this is the cutoff test, right? You're, because, you know, there are a lot of things that are going on at year end. It's a possibility that something could fall through the cracks. So you want to look at 
receiving reports uh, near, near year end and, or, or around year end, so right before and right after. Look at um, tracing from unpaid vouchers in the accounts payable ledger to receiving reports. So look at where you're going. You're going from unpaid vouchers to the receiving report. Right? You want to make sure that what's recorded in there should be recorded in there. Right? Because the receiving report is the, is the document that triggers recognition of the liability. Confirm accounts payable with normal suppliers, even those with zero balances. Why is that important? Why would you confirm a zero balance? Why do you think? Would you confirm a zero balance for accounts receivable? Hmm? Why not? What's the difference between this cycle and a sales cycle? Right, right, because your concern, here your concern is unrecorded liabilities, right? So if it's a zero balance, that means that the liability is not recorded. And you want to make sure that there should not be a liability recorded, that the zero balance is actually correct. Right? Your concern here is unrecorded liabilities. You're not going to confirm a receivable with a zero balance because how likely is a customer, like really, is a customer going to get back to you and say, oh yeah, you're right, I don't owe you any money, and if they indeed do owe you money. Right? Uh, review cash disbursements occurring after year end. Same, similar to looking at cash receipts we receive after year end, right? When we look at cash receipts after year end with respect to um, accounts receivable, that's a, an alternative procedure to test the existence of accounts receivable. Same here, reviewing cash disbursements after year end will tell you uh, if you see a cash disbursement after year end but there's no liability recorded for that, um, th that disbursement but the goods were actually received. Again, that gives you, that tells you that it was an unrecorded liability as of year end. Uh, purchase cutoff, verify cutoff for purchases. So you want to examine receiving reports, vendor sales invoices. Again, occurring around the year end, three, four days before year end, three or four days after year end to make sure the goods are in the proper period. So again, your, your, your major concern with the liabilities is going to be unrecorded liabilities. Right? So not that the other assertions aren't important, but that's your concern. You want to make sure that the com if, if, if a company is going to try to manage earnings and they're going to do it via the sales and, I'm sorry, the acquisition and disbursement cycle, it's going to manifest itself in the sense that it's going to, you're, they're going to uh, reduce liabilities or not record liabilities. So let's take a look at problem 42. Take um, about 10 minutes to walk, work through that problem and then we'll go over it together. It is on page 345, 1042, I mean 842, sorry. It's on 345 deals with search for unrecorded liabilities.
I understand. Okay, so let's take a look at this problem. So this again gets to the search for unrecorded liability. So what are some of the things? So what we're concerned with is what assertion? What's the assertion? Completeness, right? So we want to make sure that everything that should be recorded has been recorded. So what are some of the things that the auditor can do? So let's just uh, go back. 
atmosphere. Let's look at the documents. These are some of the files. Yes, Ricardo. Yes, you're smiling because you're reading the book, which is fine. <laughs> what else? That's, 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 that's audit efficiency. That also results in audit effectiveness. Okay. So, a match. Go ahead. What else? Why don't you just go through the list for us? <laughs> Put us out of our suspense. Okay. Scan the open purchase order file at year end for indications of material purchase commitments at fixed prices. Yeah, there's a lot of cutoff, right? Because, and, and that kind of goes hand in hand with the completeness assertion, right? Because you want to, what your concern is, is that they're recorded in the right period. So what you want to, is whereas with the sales and collection cycle, right, where you are concerned that there are um, sales or revenue that occurred after year end that might be recorded in, as of the reporting day, financial reporting day, right? You're thinking that they might try to push those revenues um, into the, the um, you know, financial reporting day, push them back. Here you're concerned that they might be trying to push, you know, push rev uh, liabilities out. So that their liabilities that they should have recognized as of the reporting date, but they pushed it out and, and they didn't recognize it until after the reporting date. Because your concern is, unrecorded liabilities, right? So yes, there's a lot of cutoff, there's a lot of looking, you know, um, in terms of testing the completeness, looking at the receiving report. Because again, the receiving report is an indication that we actually receive the goods and that we should be recognizing the liability. So again, I think Ricardo read accurately. Scanning the purchase order, looking at unmatched vendor invoices, reviewing the year on year end unmatched receiving reports. Um, you could select a sample of cash disbursements from the accounting period following the balance sheet date. Again, that's cut off. Uh, look at, and here we have uh, taxes, right? Because we're not just concerned about liabilities that result from um, purchasing goods or, perform, uh, or uh, purchasing a service, right? The other liabilities such as tax liabilities. So you could examine the, uh, the IRS reports to determine whether or not there are any income tax disputes. So in other words, if the, you know, the IRS is coming after them and saying, look, you underpay taxes, um, we don't agree with the amount you pay, that's an open item, that's a, con a contingent liability that they might have to pay a higher tax. Um, uh, you, want to also, you could also confirm accounts payable, especially those with zero balances, because again, a zero balance doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a liability recorded. Uh, and again, if you send a, 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 an accounts payable confirmation to a vendor saying, our records indicate that we owe you no money, if you owe that vendor money, I, I'm pretty sure the vendor is going to say, mm, nope, that's not the case. They owe us money, right? Um, study the accounts payable, trial balance for indication of dates uh, showing fewer payables than usual recorded at year end. So here's where, because um, your concern is that they're delaying recording the, the finance, uh, a, a liability, and here's where you can perform account, you're basically performing analytical procedures, right? You're comparing the activity in the current year to your, the prior year, right? Because there's an expectation. The, the prior year sets an expectation. So assuming there's nothing unusual that happened, right, or nothing that happened that would suggest that your, the payables would go down or activity toward the year end would go down, then if you see that there is a discrepancy or big, a significant difference between the prior year and the current year, that's a flag, a red flag you want to look into. See if, the, if there's any indication 
that management might be trying to defer liabilities. Um, <clears throat> also accrued expenses, right? So here are the expenses, again, where you know, accounts payable we know, right? Accounts payable usually results because we purchased a good or we, we purchased a service, we have an invoice from the vendor indicating that we owe them money, right? That we receive these goods or we have the receiving report. Accrued expenses are a little different, right? Because accrued expenses are your expectation. You, you incurred these expenses, but you haven't been billed for them yet, such as uh, payroll, for example. You incurred payroll expense, but you haven't paid the employee yet. So imagine if in companies, you know, you're paid every other week. Um, and the, your pay, the, you, you know, your last pay period in December fell on December 21st, right? The employees worked from the 22nd through the 31st. You owe them that money in December, right? That's still a part of your December 31st expense. So you would accrue that expense. So auditors are gonna look for that, things such as uh, accrued payroll, um, accrued taxes, uh, taxes payable, right? They're accruing expenses, uh, rent expense or insurance expense, things like that. Um, you would look for those types of things or, or utility expenses, right? Those things that usually occur around year end or um, that they might not get billed until the following period, the following year, so you wanna look at that. We talked about other things such as warranty, right? You, you have a warranty reserve. Companies could have warranty reserves. That involves a lot more judgment. So you wanna look at the documentation around that and look at the, the client's um, rationale for the amounts that they've estimated for the warranty reserve to ensure that uh, there shouldn't be a, 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 a higher amount. Also, you wanna look at sales revenue. Why? Because of deferred revenue, right? So if, uh, and you see this obviously with companies like subscription co uh, magazine companies or, uh, you know, or airlines, right? They're, they, they're, they, you can pay in advance of taking of that service, right? So if you order magazines, you paid your subscription in full, the company still owes you a service. So it's a deferred revenue. They can't recognize that revenue until they perform the service. Deferred revenue, uh, results in, the liability, in a liability, and so auditors, again, as you're looking at sales and collections, you want to be mindful of whether or not any of the sales result in deferred revenue. Um, and then uh, look at analytical procedures. Right? Just perform analytical procedures where appropriate. Um, you can look at prior years versus the current year, compare important expense accounts, um, you know, from year one, you know, over the, uh, the prior year to the current year. So those are um, a few of the procedures you would look at. So again, the important takeaway here is you're concerned with completeness, and you can't just focus on receiving reports or purchase orders, because not all of your liabilities arise because you received a receiving report or you issued a purchasing order. You have to take into account things like warranty expense, deferred revenue, and accrued expenses. Any questions about unrecorded liabilities? Okay, so let's wrap up. Uh, disclosure items, uh, you want to disclose payables by type, short and long-term payables, long-term purchase contracts, um, purchase from uh, related parties, if there's a dependence on any one vendor, because that creates some level of risk, right? Um, these are just things, normal things that you would disclose. Um, we're going to skip this problem because I want to give back the exam, so I just want to finish this. Other accounts in the cycle, prepaid expenses. I talked about accrued liabilities. Obviously, uh, operating expenses, inventory, uh, property, plant, and equipment. I already talked about accrued liabilities. You know the difference between an accrued liability and accounts payable. Um, things such as interest, property taxes, wages, income taxes payable. Um, so they're not normally invoiced, right? Um, or evidenced by the receipt of goods, um, which makes it more difficult. But an auditor has to be aware of the, the t understanding a client's business. So you know that if a company has long-term debt, if they've borrowed money, there has to be interest. No one's giving you the money for free, right? So there has to be interest. So you're automatically going to look at the uh, interest expense and uh, the interest payable uh, at year end to see if anything should be recorded. Um, <clears throat> 
again, with uh, accrued liabilities and prepaid expenses, you again, doing a search for unrecorded liabilities by looking at the cash disbursements in the subsequent year. Right, because most those items are like, uh, for example, interest expenses on a, uh, a a set date. Right, you have to pay a set time every month. Right, so that you're going to see the disbursement. So an auditor should look at cash disbursements to see uh, any disbursements related to interest expense and tie that back to make sure that the co the company properly accrued for that expense. And then uh, analytical procedures, you could also look at uh, agreements. Again, looking at getting a uh, board of director minutes, asking the client about any contracts or agreements. <coughs> um, substantive analytical procedures would be things such as comparing the uh, payables turnover and days outstanding and accounts payable to previous years as well as industry standards, um, compare current year balances, um, with prior year balances, compare amounts owed to individual vendors um, in the current year's accounts uh, to prior years. So just looking to see if there's any changes. Because most, unless there's something to indicate that your purchasing activity with that vendor has changed significantly, the, they're usually going to be pretty stable over time. Um, looking at purchase returns and allowances as a percentage of revenue, cost of sales, and so forth. Again, to see if the, the relationships make sense. <clears throat> uh, income tax payable, usually that's going to be, sometimes the audit, firm, uh, the audit firm's tax department actually calculates or, or prepares the client's uh, um, taxes. So you're usually able to get information directly from, if, if that's the case, directly from the team, the tax team. But also, you know, again, it's a very complex area because unlike, <coughs> you know, individual taxes where, you know, we have income, and we, have, we can itemize some deductions and so forth and so on. With companies, there are all kinds of uh, tax loopholes um, and deferred taxes so that they're able to take advantage of. And so uh, it, it becomes uh, pretty complex for an auditor to audit. And so usually they're going to look to a tax specialist for that. So again, but your vouch payments, examine documentation to support it. Um, Obvi ob you know from your financial accounting, their uh, financial accounting standards related to accounting for income taxes. So the auditor is going to want to make sure that the clients complied with the, the standards. Um, property, plant, and equipment, not going to talk about much other than to say, again, you understand you acquire goods. You have to, if, if they have um, a, a, a useful life, then you're going to uh, capitalize those. Um, those expenditures or those assets on the balance sheet and, and depreciate them over their useful lives. You know that you know, anything that doesn't, <clears throat> that's just pure maintenance, repairs and maintenance should be expensed. If it's a, a, a disbursement or an expenditure that increases or extends the useful life, then it can be capitalized. So again, the auditor is going to make sure that the company is capitalizing and expensing in accordance with the, the standards. But, um, you know, again, you want to look at authorizations. If it's a major transaction, usually, or major acquisition of a fixed asset is going to be uh, approved in the board of director minutes. Um, for red flags, look at photocopies. Again, we talked about this when we talked about uh, the sales and collection cycle in this day and age. With word processing programs, it's really difficult. But you want to be aware of that. Um, again, completeness, you want to see the invoices in numerical order. Um, you want to look at, uh, make sure that the PO boxes uh, with no other address. So if it's just a PO box, most companies, even if you send it to a PO box, they will have an address for that company, right? They'll just say send remittances to this particular uh, address, right? Uh, if the company doesn't have a listed phone number, that's unusual. How many businesses don't have listed phone numbers? Um, other things you can do is com do a comparison of the vendor file and the employee file. Because what you're looking for is that if, there are, if there's a, a match, that a, v a vendor and an employee has the same address, that's a red flag, right? That's a problem, OK? Um, <clears throat> look at multiple vendors at the same location. That's unusual, right? My address is a unique address to me, not to everyone else, right? So those are just some fraud red flags. Any questions? I went through this quickly because Again, you should see that the audit approach is the same. 
it's just it's important to know the the, the different uh, functions in this cycle um, and where the risks 